Good day students, welcome. A happy new year to you and good luck with 2019. So this is our tutorial for this year and the focus on these slides is to prepare you for the upcoming exams. So again, the grammar bits, let's talk about a subject and a predicate. You need to know the difference between those. Understand a subject and a predicate is the key to good sentence writing. The subject of a complete sentence is who or what the sentence is about. And the predicate tells about that subject. The dog ran. The dog is the subject of the sentence because the sentence is telling something about that dog. And what is it telling? It says that the dog ran. So in this simple um, example, the subject is the dog and the predicate is ran. I think what you need to know here is that you can either have to identify what is the subject or what is the predicate in a sentence. So I could give you a couple of sentences and say identify them in the exam. Or I can ask you to define what is a subject and what is a predicate and give me examples of your own. What is the difference between a clause and a phrase? Again, the clause is a part of a sentence that contains a subject a noun phrase that actively performs an action which is a finite verb. A phrase is a part of a clause or a sentence. As against, a clause is a sentence fragment. A clause has a subject and predicate, whereas a phrase doesn't. Again, I'm not going to read the rest of those things on the slide. You can go through them. If once a phrase is written in a sentence and it doesn't make sense if when it stands on its own, it doesn't make sense or has no meaning, you know that is a phrase. A clause would be extra to the sentence. It would give extra information. And that would then be, and it makes sense. It could stand on its own. Then you know that would be a clause. Again, for the exam, you need to be able to identify between the two, also give examples, or even be able to identify it within sentences that I give you. A positive. An A positive is a noun or a noun phrase that sits next to another noun to rename it or to describe it in another way. Here are some examples of A positives. Don't leave your shoes there or my dog, Ollie, will munch them. In this example, the A positive is Ollie. It is in, it is in A positive, as it's called, to my dog. My best friend, Lee, caught a whelk when he was fishing for bass. In this example, the A positive is Lee. It is in, in a position to my best friend. Dear Pat, the creator of the turnip brew, sold eight barrels on the first day. In this example, the A positive is the creator of the turnip brew. It is in a position to Dr. Pat. For the exams, I would say to know the definition of an A positive and maybe to be able to identify the A positive within a sentence. Examples of types of transitions. So, and transitions again is when you write. How do we change from one idea to the next? And there are different ways you can do it and these are the different types. The cause and effect transition. The study of human chromosomes is in its infancy, and so it has only recently become possible to study the effect of environmental factors upon them. And that is the example there. Instance transition. The ideas of econo economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than, in co than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Also an example from your study guide. Place transitions, where the walls turn up to the right, you can continue by the back, but a better path is to be found by turning. Again, place, it just shows you the place. And restatement transitions, uh, anthropologist jo Jeffrey Gorer studied a few peaceful human tribes and discovered one common characteristic. Sex roles were not polarized. Differences of dress and occupation were at a minimum. Society, in other words, was not using sexual blackmail as a way of getting women to do cheap labor or men to be aggressive. So the, tra the restatement transition. These are important to know because you need to know when to use it and why you would be using it within your writing and essay writing. 
Adverb phrases. An adverb phrase is a group of words that serves the same purpose as an adverb. Like an adverb, an adverb phrase can also modify an adjective or another verb. Bravely is the adverb. In a brave manner would be the adverb phrase. So you could have two sentences. The euros fought bravely. Then if you have to identify the words within the sentence, bravely would be the adverb. But you could also say the euros um, were fighting in a brave manner then that would be the adverb phrase. So it's the way you would write your sentence. Beautifully would be the adverb, and in a beautiful manner, beautiful style, beautiful way. Formally, in former times, once upon a time, recently, just now, or at a recent date, and soon could be before very long. So again, look at how you construct that sentence. For advert phrases, you would probably be able to ask to identify whether there's an adverb or adverb phrase in the sentence. Okay, now we're getting to different types of sentences or sentence structures. You get the simple sentence, the compound sentence, and a complex, complex sentence. I would probably ask you to differentiate between the three. And by doing that, it's a little bit more higher order thinking skills there. So you would have to give the, the definition and explain it with examples. So a simple sentence is, a, is uh, a simple sentence has the most basic elements that make it a sentence, a subject, a verb, and a completed thought. Mary and Samantha took the bus. It's one sentence. It tells you exactly what they did, but there's no detail. Mary and Samantha is, is a compound sen uh, subject, but took is a verb. A compound sentence, on the other hand, is, refers to a sentence made up of two independent clauses or complete sentences connected to one another with a coordinating conjunction. Mary and Samantha arrived at the bus station before noon and they left on the bus before I arrived. So there again you can see, you can actually say, Mary and Samantha arrived at the bus station before noon, full stop. They left on the bus before I arrived, full stop. So those could be two sentences. But by adding the coordinate, co coordinating conjunction, you're making it into a compound sentence. Then a complex sentence is made up, up of an independent clause and one or more dependent clauses connected to it. A dependent clause is similar to an independent clause, a complete sentence, but it lacks one of the elements that would make it a complete sentence. Because Mary and Samantha arrived at the bus station before noon, it doesn't make sense on its own. Um, you have to have another bit um, to make the sentence meaningful. So to make it now a complex sentence, you would say you would join an independent clause with one or more dependent clauses. Because Mary and Samantha arrived at the bus station before noon, I did not see them at the station. And that would be an example of a complex sentence. Defining a sentence. I think this is important to know what are all the elements to make that would make up a sentence. A sentence is a set of words that is complete in itself. Typically contains a subject and a predicate. It conveys a statement, a question, an ex exclamation or a command. And that third bullet point shows you the, three diff oh, the four different types of sentences. It consists of a main clause and possibly one or more sub subordinate clauses. It is the largest independent unit of grammar. It be begins with a capital letter and ends with a full stop, question mark or exclamation mark. Traditionally defined as a word or group of words that expresses a complete idea and that it includes a subject and a verb. And that's how we would define a sentence. I placed it in bullet points like that so then it's easier for you to understand it as because I could have written it all in just one paragraph or couple of sentences. So I hope that this way of, of breaking it up helps you to understand the definition better. What are the general rules regarding prepositions? It is allowed to end a sentence 
uh, with a preposition, the dress had not even been paid for. So you can end your sentence with a preposition, but be careful with how you do it. A preposition is followed by a noun. Nobody seems to have responsibility for the budget. That's the noun. A preposition is never followed by a verb. She was hiding under the table. So the preposition comes after the doing word. It is allowed to begin a sentence with a preposition or a prepositional phrase, but be very careful when you do so. On Monday, we, we will begin the new program. The subject of the sentence can never be part of a prepositional phrase, and a verb can never be a part of a prepositional phrase. Know these rules, know these bullet points, because I'm sure I could ask you these with examples. What is a paragraph? The same with what is a sentence. You need to be able to understand that so that you have clarity in how when you construct sentences, it's the same with writing a paragraph. A paragraph is a collection of related sentences dealing with a single topic, one idea. Every new paragraph needs to have a new idea. It will help you as a writer to stay on track during your drafting and revision stages. It assists your readers in following a piece of writing. Again, there the transition comes in. How you transition from the one idea to the next. If it's random ideas, then your paper or your writing won't flow in a fluent manner and would have the sequencing would be out. You can have fantastic ideas, but if those ideas aren't presented in an organized fashion, you will lose your reader and fail to achieve your goals in writing. So it's very important to know how to write a paragraph and how to move from one idea to the next. Okay, types of phrases. So we get an absolute phrase, you get an a-positive phrase and a geron phrase. An absolute phrase is a modifying parenthetical or subordinate phrase of a root sentence that includes a subject but does not have an acting verb, so cannot stand on its own as a sentence. The effort to, to, regain, the lead, to regain the lead successful, the team continued to score until they pulled away ahead by a wide margin, is an example. Their effort to regain the lead successful cannot stand, stand on its own, so you have to have that second bit. An A-positive phrase. An A-positive phrase is one that restates or a preceding term or expands or explains it in a parenthetical statement. There are three variations of A-positive phrases. Her dog, a bull mastiff, looks ridiculous with a pink bow stuck to his head. Features a noun phrase. His favorite hobby, knitting, is rather unusual for a man includes a Geron phrase and the Tahitian's ambition to become an ice skater is unexpected as an infinitive phrase. What is a Geron phrase? A Geron phrase includes a verbal, a hybrid that functions as a noun or an adjective. There are three distinct functions. Juggling knives is not recommended as a relaxation technique. technique includes a Geron phrase as the subject of the sentence. I'm going for a long walk off a short pier features a Geron phrase as the sentence object. She's saving up for a vacation in Antarctica has a Geron phrase as the object of a preposition. I think the importance here for the different phrases is to know, to be able to list the different phrases and give a definition of each. There are more. Infinite phrase. An infinite phrase includes the word to and a verb as the basis of a modification of a root sentence. His efforts to pass the bill doomed his political ambitions. Includes an infinite phrase that functions as an adjective modifying the previous noun. A no noun phrase. A noun phrase consists of a person, place or thing and any modifiers. This is a grammar lesson. It may include one or more adjectives as grammar modifies lesson here. It might include a noun and a modifying clause. This is a lesson that explains the various types of phrases. The participle phrase, the participle phrase consists of verbal ending in ing or ed, or another irregular form of a verb and serves as an adjective. The participle phrase is having been lied to before 
I was weary modifies the word I. Prepositional phrase. A prepositional phrase consists of a preposition and a noun or a pronoun that serves as the preposition's object and often one or more adjectives. I went for a walk in the dark woods. Prepositional phrases are often located at the head of a sentence. When the sun went down, I hurried back. Again, like I said, just know the definitions of the, the different phrases and be able to list the seven different ones. What is a dependent and an independent clause? Here you would be asked to differentiate between the two or compare the two. A dependent clause is a group of words that also contains a subject and a verb, but it is not a complete thought. Because it is not a complete thought, a dependent clause cannot stand on its own and as a sentence. It is dependent on being attached to an independent clause to form a sentence. So, when you're independent, you can do your own things. When you're dependent, you need help. You need somebody to guide you through it. So that's why a dependent clause cannot stand on its own and be seen as a complete thought or a sentence. An independent clause is a clause that can stand alone and as a sentence. For example, it expresses a complete thought. When there are no dependent clauses in the same sentence as the independent clause, the independent clause is a simple sentence. For example, I like coconut macaroons, which means it is an independent clause, but it's also a simple sentence because it doesn't have a dependent clause. General rules regarding prepositions. It is permissible to end a sentence with a preposition. A preposition is followed by a noun. A preposition is never followed by a verb. It is permissible to begin a sentence with a preposition or a prepositional phrase, but be very careful when you do so. A prepositional phrase always begins with a preposition and ends with a noun or a pronoun called the object of the preposition. The subject of the sentence can never be part of a prepositional phrase. A verb can never be a part of a prepositional phrase. I think you need to know these bullet points because um, I can ask you this question as is. Give me the rules regarding prepositions. Then we have active and passive voice. This is very simple. I tried to put in a, a, a dis, or a, a image that is would catch your attention. So active voice would have a subject, verb, and object. She sings a song. She's the subject, sings is the verb, and the object is the song. Passive voice is object, verb, subject. A song is sung by her. So you turn it around, you change it. Active voice, it's happening right now. Passive voice, you are telling what happened, how it happened, what it was. You need to be able to identify between the two and give examples. I could be able, I could possibly ask you to, um, I could give you sentences and then you need to then say to me, is this passive voice or is this active voice? So to identify the form it's written in. Okay, now we're getting to the second part, which is the poetry and literature sh section. What is denotation? Denotation generally defined as literal or dictionary meaning of a word in contrast to its con connotative or associated meanings. For example, if you search for meaning of the word dove in a dictionary, you will see that its meaning is a type of pigeon, a wild and domesticated bird having a heavy body and short legs. In literature, however, you frequently would see dove referred to as a symbol of peace. So the literal meaning and the, the figurative meaning are two different things. And if you have a good general knowledge, you would know these things and would be able to find it more, more easy to understand. Okay, um, within poetry or literature, you would have the devices as irony and sarcasm. It's sometimes very difficult to, to distinguish between irony and sarcasm, but I've written the, the, the exact definitions between the two so that you can know them. Know the definitions, know examples of these two. So irony uh, is the use of words where the meaning is the opposite of their usual meaning of what is expected to happen. 
a method of uh, humorous or subtle sarcastic expression in which the intended meaning of the words is the direct opposite of the usual sense. The irony of calling a stupid plan clever. Okay, an example of irony is someone who talks a lot having nothing to say when asked a question. So when you have a student in class and they always talk and when you ask them a question, they just sit there and say, I've got nothing to say. That's an example of irony. Another example would be a whaling ship being used to save marine animals after a tsunami. A funny one, though. Sarcasm is a cutting, often ironic remark intended to express contempt or ridicule. You basically want to be mean. You want to show that person that you are literally trying to make a point here. A form of wit characterized by the use of such remarks detected a hint of sarcasm in his voice. If someone can see you are plainly sick with a cold and they have ask how you are feeling, you rudely comment, never better. This is, and this is an example of uh, sarcasm. As you guys can hear my voice, lovely. <laughs> sarcasm. Function of personification. I love this one. I love using personification within poetry. Um, what is personification? Personification is giving deeper meaning to literary text. It adds vividness to express as we always look at the world from a human perspective. Obviously, because it's the humans writing the poetry or the literature. So we want to, to embrace the non-human things and make them see how we see it so that we can express that feeling very, very clearly. It brings inanimate things to life so that their nature and actions are understood in a better way. It is easier for us to, to relate to something that is human or possesses human traits. It uses encourage it use encourages us to de develop a perspective that is new as well as creative. The stars danced playfully in the moonlit sky. How nice is that? The popcorn leaped out of the bowl. They can't leap, they just fall out of the bowl. So it's just a way of expressing it. Uh, I could ask you what is the function of perso personification and then you need to show me those bullet points or s share those bullet points. I could also ask you to give your own examples of personification as well as identifying personification within a poem and to explain what, it's, what it means. Dramatic and situational irony. So getting back to irony, there's a difference between irony and sarcasm, but then you have different irony as well. There's a dr dramatic irony and situational irony. Ir the dramatic irony is the irony that is inherent in speeches or a situation of a drama and is understood by the audience but not grasped by the characters in the play. So the audience already sees what's happening. Two people are engaged to be married, but the audience knows that the man is planning to run away with another woman. In a scary movie, the character walks into a house and the audience knows the killer is in the house. But... The character that walks into the house are not anticipating that. So that's dramatic irony. Situational irony, on the other hand, is a literary device that you can easily identify in literary works. Simply, it occurs when incongruity appears between expectations of something to happen and what actually happens instead. For example, Ralph wakes, Ralph wakes up late and thinks he's going to be late to school. After rushing around to get dressed, he re realizes it is Saturday. A nice example. Okay, getting back to sarcasm, there are seven different types of sarcasm. Uh, I think you need to know the different types and I need to, you need to know what it means. So to give a little bit of an explanation there. Self-deprecating uh, sarcasm, it's an overstated sense of inferiority and worthlessness. Brooding sarcasm, Speaker utters something polite, however, the tone of his speech has a, has a marked bitterness in it. Deadpan sarcasm, it is expressed without emotion or laughter, making it difficult for the listener to judge whether the speaker is joking or mocking. So deadpan, you say it like really seriously, and then the, the person hearing it or perceiving it, they don't know how to read you how you've said it. Polite sarcasm. A speaker is said to have delivered a polite sarcasm when his listeners only get to realize that his kind remark was a sarcastic one after they had given it some thought. Obnoxious sarcasm. 
makes people feel like punching the speaker in the face. You know what it is like if you see an obnoxious person? Same thing. It is not very funny and it gets under your skin. It's irritating you. Who does this person think he is? Hence, you want to punch him in the face. Manic sarcasm. This type of sarcasm is delivered in an unnatural, happy mood that it makes the speaker look like he's gone crazy. I think that has happened to many of us. Raging sarcasm. This kind of sarcasm relies mainly on exaggeration and violent threats. So there you go. The seven types of sarcasm and a short description. Know these for the upcoming exams. What is the purpose of epigram used in poetry? Clearly, the reasons for using epigram, epigrams are plentiful. They cause the reader or listener to think a bit more about the statement being made. They are examples of pure humor. They all leave an impression. Many of them, whether through humor or blatant statements, or making a com commentary or some sort of issue, whether it be political, social, religious, or just about day-to-day -day life. The example I gave you was from Oscar Wilde. I can resist everything but temptation. That's a good one. Okay. I think you need to know more examples. So go through your study guide and go look for more examples. Because I can ask you what's the purpose and then to explain it. Understanding metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech that describes an object or an action in a way that it's literally true. But helps explain an idea or make a comparison. So be very careful between simile and metaphor. Simile is very easy because you have to look for the words like and is to show you that it's a, a simile. A metaphor is an indirect way of comparing things. So here are the basics about metaphor. A metaphor states the one thing is another thing. So comparing the thing but in a... Um, indirect way. It equates to uh, those two things not because they actually are the same but for the sake of comparison or symbolism. If you like a metaphor literally it will probably sound very strange. Um, not like if you take it literally. Uh, are there actual any sheep black or otherwise in your family? So let's look at it. You're the black sheep of the family. Are there any sheep? No. And, um, you know, are, are they black? You don't know, okay? Metaphors are used in poetry, literature, and anytime someone wants to add some color to their language or even writing. So for the example I gave you, love is a battlefield. So it doesn't have, so you're comparing your, any love, to give love, to love, to a battlefield. Because if you actually go and think about it, it is like that. Um, but I don't think all the time. You're not always fighting. You're not always in a war zone. But um, many times it is. So it's just a comparison. And obviously, using that metaphor within a poem or within uh, literature, there needs to be a context set as well. So you could then it would be explained better and the meaning would come out more. Okay, the function of satire. The role of satire is to ridicule or criticize those vices in society, which the writer considers a threat to civilization. The writer consider, considers it his obligation to expose these vices for the betterment of humanity. Therefore, the function of satire is not to make others laugh at person or ideas they make fun of. It intends at warning the public against and changing their opinions about the prevailing corruption in society. Um, if you look at the book George Orwell, Animal Farm, that book is a satire. And it's basically um, written on, it's basically a satire to show you what propaganda does. Um, and it's based on the Russian Revolution. So um, that's a very good example in, in literature about of satire. Letotes. Letotes is a figure of speech consisting of an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by negating its opposite. And I think you will understand it better if I show you the examples. He's not a very generous man. He is not very beautiful. 
He's not the friendliest person I've met. Don't be, uh, don't be too wicked. It's, it won't be an easy trip. He's not unaware of his wife's foolishness. So it's got a, a negative connotation, which is also used in, in literature a lot. Euphemism is a polite expression used in places, in place of words or phrases that otherwise might be considered harsh or unpleasant to hear. Um, fell off the back of a truck instead of stolen. So you would say, yeah, you know, the goods just fell off the back of a truck, but actually it wasn't, it was stolen. Uh, ethnic cleansing instead of genocide. If you would want to focus on how genocide took, took place, you could say it was an ethnic cleansing uh, process. Turn a trick instead of engage. Um, in prostitution, so turn a trick could, it means prostitution. Negative patient outcome means the person is dead. Uh, recol recol recollation center, meaning a prison camp. And collateral damage could be accidental deaths. There are other examples for like uh, kicking the bucket or he kicked the bucket, meaning that he died. Um, there are many, many forms that you can use as euph euphemism in poetry or in literature. Antithesis, antithesis is, is a literal meaning of the opposite. It is a rhetorical device in which two opposite ideas are put together in a sentence to achieve a contrasting effect. The, it emphasizes the idea of contrast by parallel structures of the contrasted phrases or clauses. For example, the structures of phrases and clauses are similar in order to draw the attention of the listeners or the readers. The example I gave you here, setting foot on the moon may be a small step for a man, but a giant leap for mankind. So that's antithesis, and it means the opposite. How to de detect innuendo in literature? To detect innuendo, one has to read between the lines. You need to think a, a bit more, think critically when you read something, and do not just take it as is, be too gullible of the writer in a given case and draw out by implication, conclusions that are meant to be inferred by a reader or an audience. This is done by reconstructing the argument as a contribution to a conversation, a, conven uh, a conven conventionalized type of dialogue in which the speaker and hearer or reader are supposedly engaged. In such a context, speaker and hearer may be presumed to share common knowledge and expectations and cooperatively to take part in the conversation at its different stages. By taking turns making kinds of moves called speech acts, for example, questioning and replying, asking for clarification or justification of an assertion. So that's how you would detect it. I could just ask you to tell me how you would do this, uh, detect it in literature, and not explain it. Hyperbole is a figure of speech that involves an exaggeration of ideas for the sake of emphasis. It is a device that we employ in our day-to-day -day speech. For instance, when you meet a friend after a long time, you say, it's been ages since I last saw you. You may not have met him for three or four hours or a day, but the use of the word ages exaggerates this statement to add emphasis to your weight. Therefore, a hyper hy hyperbole is an unreal exaggeration to emphasize the real situation. Some other common hyperbole examples are given below. My grandmother is as old as the hills. Your suitcase weighs a ton. She is as heavy as an elephant. I'm dying of shame. You're not really dying. She cannot be as heavy as an elephant. Your suitcase, your suitcase cannot weigh over a thousand kilograms. And the hills are really, really old because they've been there for hundreds, thousands, millions of years. And how old do we get? So do you get the point of hyperbole? Yes. I could ask you to def uh, define what hyperbole is. I could also ask you to identify the def uh, hyperbole within a poem or to give me your own examples of, hy of hyperbole. Then we have climax and anticlimax. And I placed it on the same... Um, slide so that you can actually see the difference and that it would be easy for you to make that comparison. 
A climax is a figure of speech that orders phrases and words in increasing importance. Climax is a figure of speech in which successive words, phrases, clauses, or sentences are arranged in ascending order of importance. As in, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a pla plane, it is Superman. So where's the climax? Superman. So you start from bottom and then you build it up and that's your climax. Climax has the effect of building excitement and, an, and anticipation. So you don't go out with it straight away. You need to build it up. With any story, you have some climax. But then there's den, um, uh, falling action and denouement within writing. But that's something different. Anticlimax is when a list of words, phrases, or clauses is ordered in reverse importance. This can be used for, com uh, uh, for a comedy effect. When a character or group of characters are in a moment of crisis and the final item in the list of crisis point is significantly less serious than the other two. He lost his family, his job and his house plants. So it creates kind of a, a comedy effect there because his family is the most important and then his job, his house plants doesn't mean anything. So that's anticlimax. Know the differences no examples, and be able to give a definition for that. Types of pun. What is the definition for pun? A pun is a play on words which usually hinges on word with more than one meaning or the substitution of a homonym that changes the meaning of the sentence for humorous or rhetorical effect. Homophonic pun. This type of pun uses homo homonyms. Words that sound the same, with different meanings. For example, the wedding was so emotional that even the cake was in tears. So tears is actually uh, the, ho the, the homophonic pun, because a tear could be tears running down, they were crying, but tears is also the layer of the cakes, the tear of the cake. The professor, Walter Redfern, said of this type of pun, to pun is to treat homonyms as synonyms. Okay. Homographic pun. This type of pun uses words that are spelled the same but sound different. These puns are often written rather than spoken as they briefly trick the reader into reading the wrong sound. For example, you can tune a guitar but you can't tune a fish. Unless you play bass, bass, in this case, tuna fish is a homophonic pun because it is a homonym for tune A. The word bass or bass, though, functions as a homographic pun in that the word bass, pronounced with a long A, refers to a type of instrument. I'm playing bass guitar, while bass, pronounced with a short A, is a type of fish. Okay. I think... You could get examples of homographic and homophonic puns and then you need to say what it is. This is a homographic pun or this is a homophonic pun. And definitely know the definition of puns. Then homonymic pun. A homonymic pun contains aspects of both the homophonic pun and the homographic pun. In this type of pun, the wordplay involves a word that is spelled and sounds the same, yet has different meanings. For example, Two silkworms had a race and ended in a tie. A tie can be, of course, either uh, be when neither party wins, but in this pun also refers to a piece of clothing usually made from silk. So that's the pun. A compound pun includes more than one pun. Here is a famous compound pun from English re uh, rhetorician and uh, theologian Richard Waitley. Why can a man never st starve in the great desert? Because he can eat the sand which is there. But what brought the sand which is there? Why Noah sent ham and his descendants mustard and bread? There are several separate puns, including the pun on sandwich and sandwich, and well as ham, a biblical figure, and ham, and the homophonic puns on mustard and mustard and bread and bread. Okay, just go read that and try understand. 
Uh, persuasive pun. This type of pun requires understanding the first half of the joke to understand the second. For example, a Freudian slip is when you say one thing but mean your, mo um, mean your mother. The term Freudian slip was coined by, the, um, by Sigmund Freud to refer, uh, to refer to a mistake in speaking where one word is replaced with another. Freud proposed that these mistakes hinted at unconscious or repressed desires. He also had several theories about the relationship between children, especially boys, and their mothers. Therefore, this pun requires knowledge of Freud's theories and recognition that the pun itself is a Freudian slip with the substitution of your mother or another. Synecdoche. Synecdoche is, is a figurative, not literal speech. It is. Its meaning is not to be taken for at surface value. Synecdoche is a type of figurative language that uses a part of something to mean the whole thing. For example, those wheels are awesome. The, this example substitutes the part, wheels, for the whole, car. The wheels refer to the entire car. It is not the wheels that are awesome, it is the car that is awesome. Please look at this, be able to identify the definition and the examples. Good. Um, so, focus on, on the figurative language a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, I will get back to you. Uh, yes, good luck. Thank you.